History tells us that our modern civilization is a direct reflection of ancient Greece and Rome. How did we make our way out of that period and into the light of modern day? How did we pry open the door of closed-mindedness that shut us off from our powers of intellect? Join us now as we step through that doorway to modern human experience and thought we call the Enlightenment. Also called the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment follows immediately upon the Renaissance, beginning in the late 17th century and ending in the late 18th century. While the Renaissance is known for the rebirth of art, literature, science, and exploration, the Enlightenment is known for its focus on humanism. To help us understand the Enlightenment, we have three college professors who specialize in this period of history. Margaret Jacob of UCLA. Trying to define the Enlightenment was one of the preoccupations of the Enlightenment itself. And people wrote essays at the time. Uh, the perhaps most famous definition was given by the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Darren McMahon of Yale University. Kant says that what is enlightenment? His answer is, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity he defines as your inability to use your reason uh, by yourself without uh, recourse to another's guidance. Um, and he says that it's self-imposed when the cause that prevents you from using your reason is not any inherent lack in faculties, but your own uh, lack of courage. Daniel Robinson of Oxford University. Philosophers generally think the world is going to hell in a basket. The world, by the way, generally isn't going to hell in a basket unless you view it in solely philosophical terms. Unlike previous periods, wherein changes in the culture were driven by rulers of one type or another, kings, popes, and emperors, the changes that came about during the Enlightenment were driven by common men and women with uncommon ideas. These were the secular philosophers who began to emerge during the Renaissance and continued their scrutiny of prevailing dogma during the Enlightenment. Called philosophes, the French word for philosophers, it was this new breed of thinkers who pried open the doorway to modern modes of thought during this period. The biggest single change that occurs in the Enlightenment is in the very role and nature of the philosopher. Up until the 18th century, up until the Enlightenment, the philosoph, the philosopher, was supposed to be detached, disengaged. Uh, he was supposed to deal only with issues that were theological, metaphysical. He wrote, often in Latin, for a learned cadre throughout Europe. Many of, many of the people who were philosophers were in fact also clergymen. But the 18th century, the definition of the philosopher is radically redone by this group of, of restless people. And the, the philosopher must become engagé. He must become engaged. He must um, agitate for change. The, the word philosoph uh, in the 18th century doesn't just mean philosopher. And in fact, uh, it's, it's better to use the term philosoph than philosopher because it entails something far different. The 18th century, in some ways, is the last age in which one could be a scientist, a musician, uh, a, a writer of fiction, uh, as well as a formal philosopher. And the philosophes tried to do precisely that, okay? to master everything that was worth knowing. 
Um, D'Alembert is a mathematician. Uh, he also writes on aesthetics, and theater criticism, on uh, formal philosophy. Uh, Diderot does the same. They write novels. These people are, are well-rounded in, in the fullest sense of the word and conceive of their project uh, as such. They're not narrow specialists. If, if, for example, if you, if you try to look at the origins of what we think of today as the modern secular intellectual, well, the term intellectual is not used until the end of the 19th century at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. But there's no doubt that the model for that, at least in part, goes back to the Enlightenment philosopher. Somebody who could comment with authority on any range of subjects that ought to be up to the date and up to the moment on political affairs, on religious affairs, uh, on literature, on art, on everything. Okay? Very difficult to do that today, but in the 18th century they tried and people like Voltaire, like Diderot and others actually managed. The Enlightenment spanned 100 years and several countries. It was a revolution of new ideas. It opened a doorway to new knowledge. The first generation of philosophes in the early part of the Enlightenment includes such recognizable names as John Locke in England and Montesquieu and Voltaire in France. The second generation of philosophes in the latter part of the period includes David Hume and Mary Wartler Montague in England, Denis Diderot, D'Alembert, La Maitre, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France. Immanuel Kant in Germany, and such famous Americans as Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and James Madison. In their efforts to be engaged, the philosophes of the Enlightenment were reacting to the philosophy of the Middle Ages known as scholasticism. Scholasticism had sought to use reason to substantiate what was believed on faith and ultimately to prove the existence of God through purely rational means. During the Enlightenment, the philosophes came to view their medieval predecessors with some disdain as the new ideas of the Enlightenment replaced the theological inferences of scholasticism. Students should understand that in the history of human life on Earth, civilization is but a second old, and barbarism is years and years and years. And that is not because we are by nature barbarians, it's because of the very, very hard work it takes to civilize oneself, to civilize oneself, and then to promulgate civilization, not as a way of controlling others, but a way as, as a way of enriching others. Okay, well, most people are thinking, uh, you know, philosophers, what good do they do us? And uh, the classic example of that is in Swift's Gulliver's Travels, right, where uh, philosophers on the floating island um, have to hit each other over the head periodically to wake them up because they're constantly in this stupor. It's, it's funny, if you, if you look in uh, early, uh, well, or rather late 17th, early 18th century uh, dictionaries, uh, under the word philosopher or philosophe in French, uh, you'll often find in the second or third definition uh, words like um, uh, un fou, uh, 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 an, an idiot, right? Uh, um, somebody who lives uh, uh, on his own, who uh, you know spills things on his jacket in in, uh, in in polite conversation, who can't get along with other human beings, and this is very much a kind of received stereotype of the philosopher that goes back um, to the Middle Ages and the period of scholasticism when philosophers spent their time trying to turn rocks into gold, uh, trying to figure out how many in the famous story angels could fit a, on a head of a, of a pin. The Enlightenment philosophers try to change all that and they try to, to give the idea of a philosopher much better sort of uh, a valence or definition. And they do that in part by being uh, genteel, by being um, wonderfully urbane and polite. They know how to get along, they know to, how to uh, um, have a drink or maybe two. They know how to uh, eat and, and talk and tell jokes and uh, people seek them out. So you get this reaction against what are conceived as, as the uh, negative aspects of learning. Um, and, and scholasticism is the big whipping boy for the Enlightenment. The ideas of the Enlightenment were considered quite radical in the 18th century and caused a significant stir in that society.
What were these ideas that created such a fuss and changed history forever? Oddly enough, they are commonplace today, even taken for granted in our modern culture. Back then, they were tantamount to blasphemy. Take, for example, uh, uh, an idea as, as basic and simple as happiness. We all consider it today <coughs> to be a matter of course that we have the right to try to be happy, that we ought to be happy, that in fact we can be happy, and that moreover our institutions, our governments, our schools, our families ought to work in service of that end. Well, although you can trace the idea of happiness all the way back to the Greeks, I would argue that happiness is really an enlightenment invention. In fact, we have it in the Declaration of Independence, right? That we have a right to the pursuit of happiness. This is an enlightenment idea. That this world, the world that we live in, uh, isn't just a, a passage, a kind of a vestibule or a waiting room for what is real life, a more important life, the life after heaven, uh, but rather it's important in and of itself. One of the, the central enlightenment uh, assumptions is that we've been taught for too long that pleasure uh, is somehow bad, inherently evil, uh, both pleasures of the body, sexual pleasure, uh, pleasures of the mind, uh, and that really we shouldn't uh, feel ashamed about enjoying pleasure. In fact, if we want to be happy in this world, pleasure has to be a part of that. So Enlightenment thinkers are very explicit, in fact, in uh, acknowledging, uh, and justifying, um, excusing, exonerating pleasure. Another idea that we take completely for granted today, that, that knowledge, that learning, that science uh, should serve the betterment of humanity. Fundamentally an Enlightenment assumption now. There, you know, there, there are precedents for this, certainly. Enlightenment thinkers like to look back to people like Francis Bacon at the uh, end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th century, uh, as pointing in this direction. But nonetheless, it really is with the Enlightenment that, that uh, people begin to accept uh, and take for granted the idea that science should serve us, that science can and should make our lives better. It's a new idea, uh, and it's fundamental to the Enlightenment. Another uh, legacy of the Enlightenment, which I think is, is supremely important, is the idea that reason, that critical reason, um, can again make our lives better uh, in very palpable ways, that we ought to use reason to uh, get rid of uh, superstitions and prejudices uh, that have led to suffering, that have led to inhumanity and injustice, that we can use reason uh, again in the service uh, for the betterment of, of men and women. And that's, again, a fundamentally uh, enlightened notion, one that we live with today. I, I think the most important thing to remember about the Enlightenment is that so many of the ideas that we take for granted today are born in the Enlightenment. So we think, or uh, enlightened people today think, let's put it that way, that it's wrong, absolutely wrong, to um, discriminate against someone because of their religion or because of their uh, lifestyle. Um, people in the 17th century didn't think that way. That's a new idea in the 18th century. We think, for example, that the best way to educate children is, on the whole, not to beat them. Well, it was John Locke, whose essay on education is the first person to really argue that through and say, you know, it's a really good idea. If you want children to learn, you take them by the hand and you lead them forward to instruction and you don't beat them. Simple but true. We also think that prisons, although here I think we fail utterly, for the most part, in being serious about this, that prisons should be places where people can be rehabilitated as well as serve out a debt to society. And that's an idea that begins in the 18th century. We also, many people think, that, um, that there are certain areas of an individual's life that should be, there should be a distinction between the private and the public, and that what people do in the privacy of their own homes uh, is their own business, basically. Well, that is an idea that grows out of the Enlightenment, that the state has to stop. Remember, the founding principles of the American Republic are straight out of the Enlightenment, separation of church and state, notion that um, there's a First Amendment freedom of speech. Nobody could have thought this up a hundred years earlier. Because these ideas were so radical for their era, 
One of the major questions historians seek to answer is, what era in thinking in the previous periods of history were the philosophes of the Enlightenment reacting to? What caused them to agitate for the new ideas that they were trying to impress upon their society? People in Europe by the end of the 17th century are tired of religious warfare. Uh, Europe has been at war really for the last 150 years till the time of the uh, Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 with tremendous loss of life and, and bloodshed. So there's agreement that uh, one needs to tone down uh, what, what Enlightenment thinkers refer to as religious fanaticism, religious intolerance, uh, religious superstition, um, so that people aren't dying, quite literally. Um, and then, moreover, to take a critical stance, uh, a critical look at uh, religious phenomena. Voltaire writes an essay on toleration, Locke writes on tolerance. In the view of the Enlightenment, uh, religious, specifically religious intolerance, uh, had led to massive bloodshed and, and violence in the past. And so it was important then to, uh, to respect the opinions and religious beliefs of others. In 1685, the King of France, in alliance with the Catholic Church, uh, revoked what was called the Edict of Nantes. And that edict had given the Protestant minority in France a limited degree of religious freedom. They could worship in private and so on and so forth. Well, 1685, Louis XIV says, this is over. You have to, you have choices. You either convert to Catholicism or you go to prison or you leave. And if there's any single event that acts as a catalyst for ushering in this age of enlightenment, it was the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Because all over Europe, Protestants and, and tolerant thinking Catholics were horrified. And France was a major, major power. And suddenly you had something like a quarter of a million refugees, Protestant refugees, fleeing out of France, going to the Dutch Republic, to England, to Switzerland, to parts of Germany. They came to America. There are towns founded in on Long Island in upstate New York that were founded by French Protestant Huguenots. So religious toleration is absolutely fundamental. And that uh, there was an interest in abolishing torture in criminal cases, in uh, making prisons places where people could actually survive. I mean, going to prison in the 18th century was in some places a death sentence. Um, there was a desire to separate church and state to uh, make the clergy accountable, to make monarchs accountable. And so this is an age where you begin to hear people saying things and eventually formulating theories of what we call democracy. As might be expected, the men and women of the period did not think in lockstep, but espoused a wide range of opinions and beliefs. This was natural for a period in which independent thinking was the prevailing passion. Some retained a belief in God. Others considered atheism a more accurate view of reality. Even today, historians count the schools of thought in the Enlightenment differently. Some people say there were two schools. I think there were actually three. Uh, there was what I would call a moderate or conservative uh, enlightenment that was willing, and generally you found this kind of enlightenment more in Protestant than you did in Catholic countries, that was willing to incorporate religious ideas. And John Locke, the great English philosopher, is a very good example of that. I mean, Locke was a believing Christian, although he privately didn't believe in the Trinity, but he, he, he believed in God. And he, he believed that morality had to be structured around the principles of Christianity. And I would call him a kind of conservative, moderate to conservative um, philosopher. Then you get um, philosophers like Voltaire, who are um, deists. They believe in God, but that's it. And they are deeply anti-clerical. Voltaire was so naughty, he used to sign his letters, and he wrote, oh, something like today, 20 volumes of letters. And he used to sign it with the phrase, écrasez l'enfant, crush 
the infamy. Now, letters were always being opened in those days by the government, so he didn't specify what the infamy was, but it was the Catholic Church. However, Voltaire, many of his friends, drew the line at atheism. They did not believe in atheism. But there's a radical kind of philosopher in the 18th century. So I'm making a kind of sort of a, a three-part distinction here that goes all the way out and embraces atheism, or what the age called materialism. And this was the belief that there was nothing in the universe but matter, and that nature is God, and that um, if you're going to worship anything, you would worship civil society. You would just say there is only the here and now, there is no heaven, there is no earth. All of these things are myths. And probably the most outrageous example of what I'll call the radical enlightenment uh, was a treatise that was written anonymously. We're still not absolutely sure who wrote it, although we got a pretty good idea now. And it was called The Treatise on the Three Impostors. And this thing was put together around 1710. And guess who the three impostors were? Jesus, Moses, and Mohammed. Now, that offended everybody. And that's the kind of extreme, radical form of enlightenment that I mean. There are certainly atheists uh, in the 18th century. Uh, the Baron Dolbach uh, was a famous one, Diderot, another, uh, La Matrie, uh, another, and he's an interesting character in his own right. He was a doctor um, who, because of his radical views, uh, fled France and, and lived with Frederick the Great, who was a great Prussian patron uh, and king of people like Voltaire and, and La Matrie and others. La Matrie <clears throat> writes a book called L'Homme Machine, Man the Machine, arguing that uh, all we know in the world uh, is uh, run by material processes, that um, there is no such thing as a soul, there's no distinction between mind and matter, it's all physical. Um, more characteristic are people who want to scale uh, religion back, who want to trim religion of, of its uh, superstitious elements, get rid of the cult of miracles and the worship of relics, um, to look at the Bible critically and point out and acknowledge where it contradicts itself, to not let scripture get in the way of investigating uh, the origins of the earth or the evolution of, of human species. Nonetheless, that idea can coexist with, certainly with a belief in God. Um, Voltaire uh, maintained to the very end of his life uh, that he was a theist, that he believed in a supreme being, uh, a man or woman, uh, who would, although in Voltaire's uh, view was certainly a man, but a being who had set the world in motion, uh, ordered it according to natural laws, um, and that in Voltaire's opinion there was evidence for this everywhere you looked, uh, the best evidence being the argument from design, that if you look at an eyeball, uh, or a nose, it's very apparent that uh, it was designed for a specific purpose, to see or to smell. And in Voltaire's view, like many other educated people in the 18th century, uh, that design could have only come about with the help of a, a supreme being and, and intelligence. So there, there are these, um, these ranges. Uh, there are also many uh, enlightened Christians in the 18th century. Uh, and that's important, I think, to, to accept and realize, particularly in the United States. Uh, people, again, who want to uh, take the spirit of the times um, uh, and put it to the service of bettering humanity, using their reason constructively and whatnot, but trying to make that coexist uh, with a belief and, and faith in, uh, in Jesus Christ or uh, another being. Of course, the men and women of the Enlightenment didn't live in a historical vacuum. Just as we draw upon the insights of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, the philosophes drew upon the wisdom of the sages who preceded them. In doing so, they sought to catalog all knowledge in a single reference. They called this reference the Encyclopedia. In the, the preface and the preliminary discourse, the Encyclopedia, which is this uh, great Enlightenment undertaking, an attempt uh, on the part of Diderot and uh, D'Alembert and others uh, to synthesize everything that's been known uh, to date, a massive undertaking and symbolic really of the whole Enlightenment project of uh, using reason to, to, uh, to uh, put in one place and collect all that uh, is thought and known. The preliminary discourse to um, uh, the encyclopedia, D'Alembert writes it, uh, 
says that there are important Enlightenment ancestors, uh, people who have come, come prior to the Enlightenment, uh, who didn't live in an enlightened age, but nonetheless were ushering in the light of the times. Isaac Newton is absolutely critical uh, here. He's one of the great Enlightenment heroes. Uh, Voltaire writes uh, a summary of Newton's Principia Mathematica. Uh, his mistress, uh, Voltaire's mistress, uh, Madame du Châtelet, translates the Principia. Uh, and it's used in France until the Second World War, so just a, mar a marvelous achievement. And uh, it's worth pointing out here uh, that there are uh, not just hommes de lettres, men of letters in the 18th century, but femmes de lettres, uh, women of letters. Madame du Châtelet is a perfect example. Well, Enlight Newton becomes an Enlightenment hero. Well, why? In some ways, he's, he's uh, appropriated. Newton, as you know, was a, uh, a deep-thinking uh, and devout man who spent uh, as much of his life exploring the physical uh, dimensions to the universe um, as studying scripture. He wanted to, to uh, ascertain uh, prophecy from the Old Testament, so he's a devout believer. Nonetheless, he seems, at least in the Enlightenment's eyes, to... <coughs> put forth uh, the mathematical structure and laws uh, to the universe, holding up a model of the way in which reason um, can, uh, can ascertain the underlying structure uh, of the world. And this becomes not only a huge achievement in its own right, but for Enlightenment thinkers, a model uh, of the way that we might think about the world in other realms, in other non-physical realms, in moral realms. And many Enlightenment thinkers were enticed by the possibility that there was not only a natural physical law that underlay the universe, but a natural moral law, discernible like the laws of gravitation through reason, and that if we could figure out what they are, we could uh, get people to agree on moral uh, controversies in a way that, that they haven't always been able to uh, when led solely by uh, religion. Francis Bacon is another uh, uh, great Enlightenment hero, another uh, man signaled by D'Alembert and others in the preliminary discourse. Bacon uh, is important for the Enlightenment because he seems to get across in a very programmatic and self-conscious way the idea that science ought to serve humanity. Um, again, this, this stereotype, the received stereotype at, in Bacon's time at the end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th century, uh, is of, a, of the scientist who's an alchemist, uh, somebody who is not dealing with practical matters and certainly not uh, bringing any benefit to humanity. Well, Bacon, even before science had become uh, the force that it would become in the 18th century, um, nonetheless understood that science was going to shape uh, profoundly uh, human life and that it ought to. It ought to do so in, in a, a positive way, um, that we should... Uh, use uh, reason and uh, technology and science to the, the betterment of, of humanity. This is a, 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 an idea that the Enlightenment, uh, Enlightenment thinkers take for granted and they owe in part to Bacon. Even as Renaissance men were heroes to the philosophes of the Enlightenment, the second generation of philosophes found heroes in the earlier generation of French philosophers. John Locke is another important hero for the Enlightenment. Um, if Newton was the, uh, the, the man who discerned the physical uh, uh, structure of the universe, uh, many people conceived uh, of, of Locke as the Newton of the mind. In fact, that's the phrase that Voltaire used. Um, why? Well, the, the Locke uh, of the Enlightenment, at least uh, in Europe, is not the lock of the United States, the lock, that is, of the two treatises on government that were so important uh, uh, as background to the American Revolution. The lock who's influential uh, in France and uh, elsewhere on the European continent in the 18th century is the lock uh, of the essay concerning human understanding, a book, a book of uh, a work of epistemology, uh, the science of, of how we know. And in that uh, in that text, Locke puts forth his uh, famous idea of the tabula rasa, that we're born into the world with a blank slate, a tabula rasa, uh, without preconceived ideas. A notion that we, many of us take for granted today, uh, but then the 17th century is, is relatively new. Uh, the dominant uh, understanding then is that either we have preconceived or uh, innate notions, 
uh, a conscience, a kind of structure that underlies our mind. Uh, or uh, there's the Christian notion of original sin. In other words, our nature is shaped in some way by uh, the fall in the garden, the original sin of Adam and Eve, uh, that we all share. Well, Locke de-emphasized this aspect uh, and argued that <clears throat> our minds are blank slates. Uh, and really are products of the sensations, the physical sensations, uh, light and uh, touch and sound and so forth, that we experience in this world. This seemed, for Enlightenment thinkers, a, a very powerful idea. Because it opened the way then to conceiving of human beings as not inherently evil, uh, as not inherently one way or another, but open to what was given to them in the world. So if the mind was a blank slate and you treated the mind well, if you gave it good things, uh, you could grow uh, human beings uh, who were good as well. This is a powerful idea for uh, Enlightenment thinkers and they, they draw on us fully. Clearly, the objective held commonly by the philosophes of the Enlightenment was the betterment of mankind. But such progress never comes quickly. In fact, some philosophes saw very little change during their lifetime, and this was cause for much frustration. Enlightenment thinkers are frustrated uh, at uh, the slowness of their time. Kant, uh, in answering the question, what is enlightenment, says famously um, that we live in an age of enlightenment, but we don't live in an enlightened age. Okay? Voltaire, in his famous uh, book Candide, uh, chronicles one horror after another. Religious fanaticism, intolerance, superstition, man's cruelty to man. It's an endless saga of, uh, of, of the silliness and stupidity of, uh, of men and women. The other thing uh, that's important to, to think about uh, in terms of thinking of the philosophe is a conscious and self-conscious effort to make ideas fun. Okay. Um, I have a friend uh, who studies the 17th century, and she always says, the Enlightenment thinkers don't say anything new, uh, at least anything new compared to the 17th century. They just say it in a wittier way, uh, with a more amusing way. Now, this is an exaggeration, definitely, but there's some truth to it as well. And that Enlightenment thinkers try to make their ideas amusing. They write in many different forms. They write poems. They're not averse at all to scatological humor, to off-color jokes. Um, they tell their anecdotes um, with tremendous esprit, with wit. Um, and so they present their ideas, they package them, as it were, uh, in a way that uh, you know, uh, contemporary American academics would uh, do well to uh, study, I think. In addition to the ideas of humanism that grew out of the Enlightenment, political and economic ideas sprang up as well. A specialized cadre of philosophes known as physiocrats made it their goal to understand the operation of economic law. Physiocracy, or uh, the physiocrats, people who, who practice physiocracy, uh, are economists, uh, 18th century economists, and they're part of a wider European movement. Um, People talk of the, the Cameralist movement in Austria or Prussia, the utilitarian movement uh, in England. The people who think that uh, not only should we have moral science, uh, but that we should have political science, that we can uh, make government efficient uh, through um, uh, proper means. Economics is critical to this. In some ways, uh, Quenet, Mirabeau, and other of the physiocrats are very modern, particularly with economic questions. They believe, for example, that uh, one should get rid of uh, tariffs, um, of guild restrictions, and allow for the free exchange of goods, that this will uh, lead to greater productivity, uh, that this will lead to uh, betterment for all. The physiocrats are specifically a French phenomenon. They are theorists who are trying to figure out what are the co constituting elements that make prosperity possible. You know, how can you advance an economy? And in that sense, they very much belong to the Enlightenment. They're interested in progress. They're interested in economic development. But they come to the conclusion that the wealth of a country is entirely grounded on its agricultural resources, on the land. And I'm, you can see why they would be French because uh, France had this immensely diverse agricultural system that meant that in the south of France you, you had a Mediterranean climate, in the north you had vast areas for grain growing and so forth, so it's very rich.
agriculturally. Although by the end of the 18th century, the heirs to the physicrats um, uh, take up physicratic notions and try to apply them to government as a whole. The best example of this in France is uh, uh, Anne uh, Turgot, who's actually Minister of Finance, First Minister of State, briefly from uh, 1774 to 1776. And he tries to take physiocratic Enlightenment ideas and apply them to government, okay, to make life better. Um, unfortunately, he runs into all kinds of snags. He tries to free the grain train, France's, um, uh, the tra trade in grain in France in the 18th century uh, is limited by uh, uh, tariffs uh, and border restrictions, um, all kinds of uh, uh, monopoly controls and so forth. And he tries to free the grain trade and he generates in the process a terrible reaction and is forced to, to step back. He tries to abolish guilds, right, the, uh, the mechanism that controls uh, labor, artisanal labor in France, to free it up so that, you know, people could compete. Again, a very modern idea, but it leads to a backlash uh, um, from all those who have any stake in the guild system and many others, um, and he, uh, he, he has to resign in failure. As we have seen, the daring ideas of the Enlightenment made their way to America, took root, and flourished in ways no one could have predicted. This was where the humanist precepts of the philosophes met with the best economic principles of the physiocrats to create political magic. We've already seen that in previous periods of history, major changes were always made by rulers. Should anyone doubt that ideas are as powerful as rulers, we have only to look at the American Revolution. In fact, it could be said that the American Revolution would not even have taken place were it not for the inspiration of the Enlightenment. This is the only nation in the history of the world that, that was invented. It, it didn't evolve out of something going on since a time out of memory. It, it actually had people sit down and say, how are we going to do this? Of all the times to invent a nation, I can't imagine a better time than the 18th century. We had had the 17th century, the age of Newton, Newton, Galileo, Descartes, Robert Boyle and company. So we had that entire optimism of science back there. And then we had the Enlightenment itself. We had those French philosophes. We had the English and Scottish versions. The Scottish Enlightenment had a profound influence on American revolutionary and, and colonial thought, Thomas Reed. Um, Radical Johnny Witherspoon brought, brought to Princeton to bring Scottish common sense philosophy to education in America, doing it so successfully that one student after four years decided to stay a fifth year just to study Scottish common sense philosophy, a fellow by the name of James Madison. Um, so we had to sit down and decide what kind of place this was going to be. The results of that labor were miraculous. I mean, just ask yourself if you were sitting down today to contrive a form of governance and a rule of law that would be respectful of the liberty and dignity of the individual, but in such a way as to preserve the political community itself. Can you imagine documents that are any clearer, any better written than those? by people who had much to lose. They were all traitors, you know. They all recognized that if this thing didn't work, <laughs> they'd have their heads on traitor's gate, do you see? Now, how are we doing in relation to that very, very good head start? Well, we're a much bigger place, geographically, in terms of the population. There are 260, 70 million of us spread all over the United States. We've got television sets and CDs and radios and cell phones and, and the internet. We, we've got all of this stuff and at the same time we prize neighborliness. We do try to be virtuous in our dealings with one another. Even the most ragtag gang of teenagers out making mischief are trying to do something that matches up with their conception of courage or, or manliness. It's, an, it, it's misdirected, it's dangerous, it has to be put on the right footing. Although the founding fathers of the Union of States in America all supported Enlightenment ideals, one man 
recognized as the author of the Declaration of Independence, stands out as its most ardent voice, Thomas Jefferson. Yes, Thomas Jefferson is a, a perfect representative of the European Enlightenment. Now, he's, he's born in the New World. He's educated at the College of William and Mary, but one of his teachers, uh, Dr. Samuel Small, was uh, right at the center of enlightened circles back in England. Um, Jefferson's, if you look at his correspondence, people he's talking to, the people he's interested in, the people he's reading, are all people we would associate you know, with the Enlightenment. And he has imbibed those attitudes and values before he gets to Paris. And then by the time he gets to Paris, what interests him is the advances in science that he encounters there, but the attitudes and values of intoleration and um, privacy and freedom of speech and so forth, he, he has those already fixed in his mind before he goes to the old world. Thomas Jefferson went on to become the third U.S. president, applying to his administration the principles of the Enlightenment that he had learned. So passionate was his belief in the ideals of that period that in addition to the intellectual heritage he contributed to the nation, he also contributed one of the rare physical monuments to the Enlightenment. I often point to uh, Jefferson's Monticello as a kind of classic example of a, of a monument of the Enlightenment. It's true that the Enlightenment doesn't leave behind the kind of tomb of Tutankhamun, right? Uh, that, uh, that goes on, a, makes a nice road show. Uh, although there are Enlightenment monuments. The French Revolution began in 1789, the same year the Union of American States was established by the U.S. Constitution. Following so closely upon the heels of the American Revolution, which was undeniably influenced by the Enlightenment, could it be that the French Revolution also had its roots in the Enlightenment? If you look at the founding uh, document of the French Revolution, the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, there are enlightened and Rousseauian ideas present there, uh, and they're on the lips of people uh, in, in the revolution. Uh, certainly not the overwhelming cause, uh, but it has to be factored in when one considers the causes of the French Revolution, certainly. If you look for political theories that are working in the French Revolution, um, I think Locke is important because he was translated into French. Um, he's certainly important in shaping the very early stages of the French Revolution, when they still believe it's possible to have a British-style constitutional monarchy. And Locke was seen as the great explicator of constitutional monarchy. In the more radical phase of the French Revolution, um, symbolized, I guess, most precisely by Robespierre. Robespierre read Rousseau like it was the Bible. Rousseau would have been pretty horrified at what went on in the radical, in the terror of the French Revolution. But certainly the democratic aspects of the French Revolution have a debt there to Rousseau. Right from the, the very beginnings of the French Revolution, the people, both proponents of the revolution and uh, its opposers, who want to claim that the revolution is Voltaire's fault. In other words, that, uh, that the ideas of the philosophes uh, have somehow brought about and caused the revolution. As I say, the proponents of the revolution really do reaffirm this idea. In, in the summer of 1791, in July, they bring the remains of Voltaire uh, from Ferney, his estate uh, and resting place, where he was buried outside of uh, Geneva in Switzerland. The revolutionaries bring his remains back to France. And they place them where? In the Pantheon, okay, which is now in the 5th arrondissement, close to the Sorbonne in Paris. 
But until the French Revolution was uh, a neoclassical church, the Church of Saint Genevieve. So the revolutionaries take this perfect symbol of, of Catholic faith and transform it into the resting place of the great men uh, of the revolution. And one of the first people they place there is Voltaire. There, I think, undoubtedly are uh, links between uh, certain aspects of the French Revolution and certain aspects of French thought. Um, the, the, the attack on uh, uh, religious fanaticism as a term uh, certainly uh, bears fruit, and, and, and maybe fruit is not the right word to use. It certainly has consequences in certain respects, bloody consequences in the revolution in ways that none of the philosophes could have anticipated and certainly would have, wouldn't have liked. But nonetheless, I think there are, are links in this respect. The French Revolution is considered by some historians to mark the end of the Enlightenment. Although this remarkable period ran its course over 200 years ago, it might seem like ancient history to young people. The legacy of the Enlightenment survived the Industrial Age and lives on today. In fact, it can be seen even in our personal lives as we enter the 21st century. We are free to pursue personal happiness as long as we don't infringe upon the happiness of others. Our lives abound with products conceived and developed from our sciences. The application of reason to every aspect of our lives is now second nature to us. And the constitutions under which our governments were formed have immortalized these enlightenment principles we owe the very nature of our lives to this extraordinary period of history that we call the Enlightenment.